So I'd now like to introduce Chris. I'm sure you know who Chris is. Um, he's one of the strongest left-wing supporters of Jeremy Corbyn in Parliament. Is there time and time again supporting Corbyn and supporting the new direction of the Labour Party and standing up for grassroots members like us. Um, and unfortunately, not all of Chris's colleagues have been um, doing that quite so much recently. So I'd like to welcome Chris uh, and thank you for coming to Portsmouth. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed for that introduction, Chair. It's, it's great to be uh, in Portsmouth uh, with uh, friendly faces here. The last time I was here was to see Derby County, and uh, Portsmouth stuffed us 6-2, actually. But <laughs> it wasn't quite as one-sided as that game uh, seems to imply. We, we were robbed, actually. We, should, we, we were kind of all over you. We, we made it, I think, to 3-1, and we should have had a, a free kick just outside the, uh, the penalty area. And then the referee didn't give it. And then you went down, scored, and made it. You know, anyway. So there we go. Oh, no, it was four. No, it was three two. Then we we we, should, we nearly got an equaliser. That was it. And then you went off. And, <laughs> anyway, there we are. Such is life. That's the game of football, isn't it? Um, I'm a Derby County BC supporter actually as well, which is Derby County before Clough. And uh, it's great to have such a, a great legacy of that as the uh, former, you know, manager of, of Derby County. Who was a, who was a great socialist, and indeed he used to come on to the, the street and campaign alongside my predecessor, and indeed in. His latter years, he also helped us in the local elections when I was leader of the of the council. Anyway, that's Derby and uh, Derby County. It's good, as I say, to be here in uh, in Portsmouth. I just wonder, does anybody know who let the dogs out? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah um, I mean, Tony Tony Benn said that democracy is the most revolutionary thing in the world, and given the reaction to the Democracy Review and this democracy. Roadshow, you can tell precisely what he was talking about, really, because it seems that people in positions of power, the establishment, are desperate to prevent grassroots members of the party, ordinary members of the public, having the greater say over the direction of our party and indeed the direction of the country. And for me, I think this democracy review and the proposals around mandatory reselection or open selection as it's as it's called nowadays are essential to enabling us to transform and democratize the country as well because over the last 40 years in particular what we've seen is the political sphere losing more and more influence and the corporate unaccountable sphere gaining more and more power and influence and the consequences of that has been this 40 years of neoliberalism of course has meant that working class communities in particular have borne the brunt of globalization where previously secure decent well-paid jobs have been offshored to low-wage economies and you know back in the day in the mid 1970s when I was still a young man uh, working as an apprentice bricklayer I was earning enough money in those days to buy myself a brand new three bedroom semi detached house backing onto a waterfront in a desirable village eight miles south of Derby. Now, I think the prices in Derby were probably a little bit less than what the, you would pay maybe in Portsmouth, but not that much less, I've got to say. And I also, in the sort of late 1970s, was a National Executive Committee member of the Hunt Saboteurs Association. And we used to have our Executive Committee meetings in each other's parlours rather than hiring rooms out so we could keep any resources that we got for the, for the campaign. And there was a few people on the committee from London. There's a mate of mine, a chap called Bob August. And he had a lovely townhouse, three-bedroom townhouse, around the corner from the Kennington Oval. And he had a bit slightly better job than me. He wasn't a brickie. He didn't work with his... He wasn't a horny-handed son of toil like me. He, he was a soft sort of uh, office swallow, you know. Uh, but no, but he just worked in an office, you know. He was a draftsman or something. And he got this beautiful house. I mean, nowadays, that'd be worth millions of quid, wouldn't it? That's, well, I'd say worth. That's what you'd have to pay for it. So the housing crisis, you know, has meant that, you know, home ownership is, is beyond working class people, beyond many middle class people for that matter. Council houses have been eliminated, they've been sold off. We've not built hardly any for, for many, many years. And the private renter sector has grown and people are trapped very often, and even people on decent salaries. And my kids are in that situation, actually, paying huge uh, rents which means that it's difficult for them to save up for a deposit because they've got like, a massive deposit. And so consequently, you know, there's, there's a huge housing crisis here. As I've said, jobs have been offshore to low-wage economies. We've seen the 
anti-trade union legislation being brought in and not repealed sufficiently when we were last in government. And so it's been made a lot easier for you know, global corporations to come in and exploit workers. And, and so what we've seen is the whole kind of economy de being deployed in the interests of the, the 0.1%. I think Owen Jones refers to it as socialism for the rich. And what we want to do is socialism for the many. That's what we're all about. Uh, and that's why I think the establishment are throwing as much dirt as they possibly can at us and how they've managed to squeeze out of the headlines during the summer recess the positive policy programme that Labour's putting forward now. Our policy agenda, if you look at it, is supported by between 70 and 80% of the public. If you just, and that sounds absurd, doesn't it, given that we're, we're bumping around at 40 odd percent in the opinion polls, sometimes a little bit below, sometimes a little bit above. But if you break down each individual policy, the key policies, there's massive support for it. 83% want the water industry brought back into public ownership. That's a key Labour policy. Around 78, 77, 78% want railways brought back and the gas and electricity brought back. Hardly surprising when you think about how much is being wasted effectively, creamed off for shareholders in shareholder dividends, that if it was in public ownership, could be deployed to reduce the cost of bills, reduce the cost of train fares, and actually have money left over to invest in the infrastructure. And I often wonder how much these kind of executive wallers and these oligarchs, how much money do they want? And they can't spend it. They can't spend it and they still be rich yeah. even after the reforms that we want to bring in. It's just selfishness really and it's about power I think isn't it? And what I always say to, to people going around when I'm knocking on doors and there are certain, I'm sure you, you probably have a similar tale yourselves really, is that you know the wealthy, the corporations, they've got power because they've got money, they've got wealth, but we've got power when we stand together. We've got power through solidarity. And when we do stand in solidarity, we are unbeatable, that's the point. <coughs> that old, you know, maxim, you know, the workers united will never be defeated. If only we were united more of the time, we would never be defeated. We wouldn't have been defeated in the miners' strike, we wouldn't have been defeated in the steel workers' strike, and the print strike, and all the other you know, disputes down the uh, ages. We need that working class solidarity. And so I think this democracy review is very much about that. And there was a, there was a really great phrase that Ed Miliband uh, said when he was standing for the leadership. And I was really struck by it because what he said was that if we trusted our members, we wouldn't have made as many mistakes in government as we did. And if you think about it, that's absolutely on the money, isn't it? And I'm just, I'm just saying, it's been writing this, because Morning Stars asked me to write a piece for the TUC conference, which they distribute round the copy of it free to all delegates, trying to get them on side for the uh, motions which will be put to Labour Party conference around mandatory selection, which I'll come on to in a minute. But if you think about it, just going back on to if we trusted our members, if we'd listened to our members, if members had more of a an influence over the policy direction of our party, we wouldn't have gone to war in Iraq. We wouldn't have extended privatisation. We wouldn't have introduced tuition fees. We wouldn't have brought private health care into the National Health Service. We wouldn't have allowed the continuation of the good quality jobs in this country being offshored to low wage economies. It always sickens me when you see the likes of James Dyson clothing himself in the Union Jack and saying what a great patriot he is. And yet he's moved all of his operations over to the Far East so he can make more money. Now, just imagine if we'd had a policy in place, a policy that was contained in our manifesto, we said when a company wants to do something like that, or when you get a, um, a hedge fund coming in and asset stripping a company, kicking people onto the dole and offshoring the jobs, etc., the workers will be given the first right of refusal to buy that company out. And it won't just be a theoretical right, it will be backed with finance from the National Investment Bank and there will be an agency available to give the workforce the advice that they need to do the necessary legals and the financials associated with creating a worker cooperative. And it really would be an opportunity to deliver the vision that Tony Benn set out all those years ago about industrial democracy. If we've got industrial democracy, you know, we would be able to give kids a stake in society again, a, 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 you know, a future a secure opportunity of a secure uh, career 
And of course we are in the beginnings of the fourth industrial revolution, aren't we? And we need to make sure that we garner the benefits that will flow from that for the, for the majority, for everybody, for the many, not the few. And I'm old enough to remember back in the 1960s watching things like Tomorrow's World and so on. Those in the audience might remember that. Uh, being told to get ready for the leisure generation. Do you remember that? Because by, apparently by the time of the 1990s we're only going to be working 10 or 15 hours a week, you know. Because automation would, meant, would mean that a lot of those jobs that are currently being done by, by manual workers, you know, using their hands, skilled workers, etc., would be taken over by uh, automation. And the next iteration of that, of course, is robotics and artificial intelligence. And that will take more of those blue-collar jobs out, but it will also start impinging on a lot of middle-class jobs as well. You know, um, accountancy and things like that will be done probably more efficiently by artificial intelligence. Now, I'm a Luddite, because what the Luddites wanted was technology to be the people's servant, not its master. But of course the Luddites have been demonised, haven't they? By the establishment, by the powers that be, because they had the temerity to make such an assertion. And when it wasn't delivered, they went round quite rightly, and I think if I'd have been round those days, I don't know if there's anybody here from the Daily Mail secretly recording me, but no doubt it'll probably end up on the front page of the Daily Mail or something, but I'd have gone round smashing up those machines as well. Because what they were saying was, well, sorry, we know you've got all those skills, but sorry, we've got this more efficient way of doing it, and we're just going to keep all the benefits of that for ourselves. That's just unacceptable. We need to, yes, harness this new technology, this artificial intelligence and robotics, but for the benefit of the many. And so that we can, you know, go back into education if we want to. We can have the resources to invest in public service. And I remember, again, Tony Benn talking all those years ago, about where the when he was going for the deputy leadership, where the growth in jobs will come from, because he could kind of see the writing on the wall back then, will be in the public sector. And that's a good thing. Investing in decent, good quality public services. Stop using them as a cash cow for the private sector. Kick the privateers out of the public sector altogether, not just out of the NHS, but out of the entirety of the public sector. Because what happens when the private sector comes in and takes over a public service that's run by a local authority? Well, the first thing they do is they, they attack the terms and conditions of the workers. And then very often the quality of the services provided is also diminished. And so it's a lose-lose situation as far as consumers are concerned and workers are concerned. The people that benefit, of course, are the, the people that run those companies, the, the, you know, the 0.1% again. And so we need to move, it seems to me, <coughs> away from that. And we can use the benefits <coughs> excuse me, of artificial intelligence to enable us to secure those benefits for the many, not the few. But in order to achieve that, we have to make sure that we've got a political programme in place and parliamentarians in place that actually back that, support that, that will pay cognizance to the values of the party and the, the values and the priorities of the members who actually select them in the first place and then actually get them into parliament. Because no Labour MP is in parliament by, by, their, by the strength of their own merits. They're there because they stood under a Labour banner and because of the hard work of Labour Party activists. So there's a huge prize at stake here, you know, huge investment in public services. Kicking into touch that absurd notion you've got to work until you drop. Of course, we can't afford a pension, you know, apparently. So we've all got to work a lot longer. <coughs> what, what an absurdity. If we'd have taken that attitude in 1945, we well, they never built the National Health Service because we'd be spending all the money paying back the angst for, the, uh, for the, the debt that we'd built up uh, in fighting the war. But Clem Attlee said no. We're not, because that's, uh, Churchill told him not to make any outlandish promises and he said no. We're not, we are going to create a better world. And it's my mum and dad's generation, the younger generation, just like today, who say we, we've had enough of this. We ain't, go, we ain't going back to what happened in the 1930s. It's my mum and dad's generation that voted for a Labour government that brought us the National Health Service when the debt-to-GDP ratio was 250%, that bought us the welfare state, that built a million houses, that maintained full employment and set in train a post-war settlement that lasted for 34 years until Thatcher came into power. And so I think we need to be recapturing that spirit of 1945. And indeed, we did get the biggest increase since 1945 in vote share. 
uh, last time in the 2017 uh, election. Had it not been for the malcontents and the saboteurs and the worst possible run into an election in my lifetime, probably the worst run into an election ever, you know, we would now be transforming this country. Jeremy would now be in number 10. Indeed, had Ed Miliband trusted his instincts, we'd have never lost that election in 2015. We'd have had a more progressive programme. I mean, I used to wonder why Ed used to, like, exasperatedly say, oh, the thing that really gets me is when people say, you're all the same. But then, if we, yeah, that's true, Ed, but you need to have a policy agenda which makes it a bit different, and our agenda wasn't sufficiently different. That's the, <coughs> that's the point. So there's, so there's a huge prize at, at stake there, and that's why I think this democracy review, you know, as I say, is going to be so important. Just on that point about education, as well, just before I go into the detail of the the democracy review, your touch on it, I won't go into complete detail because I don't know what the detail is yet because it's got to go through the NEC. But just thinking about that, the, benefit, the opportunities through education. I mean, the minute, you know, education has been commodified, hasn't it? You know, people having to pay tuition fees and free schools and academies and all the rest of it. And, uh, and uh, Tony Benn was extolling the virtues once of um, lifelong learning. And he said we should raise the school leaving age to 75. <laughs> and uh, he said that a couple of weeks later, he received a letter from a disgruntled 85-year-old who said, why are you discriminating against me, Mr. Ben? Because I've just graduated from the Open University. What have you got against me? He said, I've changed my position. There should be no upper ceiling on the uh, opportunities for lifelong learning. And we should be able to go in and out. And I think with you know, the benefits that will flow from artificial intelligence, if we get the right political agenda, the right political will, just as we showed in 1945, we will, people will be able to go in and out of education not have to pay huge great tuition fees for the uh, you know the privilege of doing so we all benefit as a society don't we from an educated uh, workforce from an educated um, uh, community uh, uh, as a whole we all benefit from that uh, individually you benefit from that but collectively i think we benefit uh, from that and, and and i think this is the prize this is what is possible navara media talk about uh, fully automated luxury communism is, is now doable because of new technology. It was never really possible in the 20th century, but now we have an opportunity to harness the benefits of new technology for the benefit of the many, not the few. So some of the things, just to talk a bit about then what I think is going to be coming through the Democracy Review. The first one, of course, is the, uh, how we elect our leader and the way in which you get onto the ballot paper. What we can never do, I think, is go back to a situation or allow a situation to continue where the uh, preferred candidate, obviously, as Jeremy was, had to scrat around, begging and pleading and MPs patronising, said, well, I'll lend my vote, you know, to, to promote a debate. We can never be in that situation again. Partly because, having been stung, people who disagree with Jeremy, they'd never, they'd never do that. They'd never lend their nomination to uh, a candidate uh, like uh, Jeremy in the future. So the proposal which is likely, I think, to come out of the Democracy Review in relation to the uh, leadership elections and in terms of getting onto the ballot paper, is to reduce the threshold of MPs down from 15% of the PLP at the moment down to 5%. I mean, frankly, if it were me, I would, I would remove MPs from it entirely because the party doesn't belong to the MPs. The Parliamentary Labour Party is not the Labour Party, despite what the media, the lazy media, like to characterise it as being. And they keep going on about, oh, the Labour Party's divided it's split no it's not i go all over the country i've been to the borders of scotland wales and almost down to land's end and you know meetings like this and, and much bigger meetings as well and people there's a real sense of purpose and, and determination and unity a, a, a spirit i've never witnessed in the party in my 42 years you're the party the grassroots of the party not a handful of people in parliament Less than 0.04%, that's the total there. And yes, the PLP is divided, there is no doubt about that. But anyway, that's me, and I didn't have control over the Democracy Review, so the MPs will have some role, but it will be a more diminished role. And I think that by reducing that threshold, that will make it uh, a lot easier, I think, for all shades of opinion. And this isn't to say that you know, the right of the party should be excluded from the um, ballot paper, because all shades of opinion should be on the ballot paper, and it should be up to the members. I mean, if the members had wanted to support Liz Kendall, well, fair enough. I'd have just had to, you know, swallow hard and accept that. I swallowed hard and accepted Tony Blair when he got elected, and I worked hard, unlike some of the people in the PLP who seem to spend most of their time undermining and sabotaging our electoral 
prospects. I worked tirelessly to get Labour elected when Tony Blair was the leader. I even had the indignity of some people accusing me of being a Blairite, for God's sake. So, you know, that was a, a bitter pill to swallow. And I just wish that some of the characters in the PLP now would take a, a, you know, a page out of my playbook, maybe, and just sort of accept that we've got a programme which is supported by the overwhelming majority of the public. We have a leader who is overwhelmingly elected by the membership. Just accept the democratic will of the party and get on with it and start fighting for a Labour government instead of facilitating the Tories and letting them off the hook, just as they did in 2016 when they mounted the coup, at a time when the Tories were in absolute disarray. At a time when we had, for the first time, probably since George Lansbury, a genuine socialist as the leader of the party and the possibility of an early election. And I wrote a piece in the Morning Star suggesting that they were behaving as if they were Linton Crosby sleepers who'd been put into the Labour Party 10 or 20 or 30 years ago for this very moment when the Tories are in disarray, when Labour has a socialist as a leader and a socialist programme and the possibility of implementing socialism in our country, they're then activated to cause maximum disruption. And I tell you what, if Linton Crosby had done that, he couldn't have been more effective because that's precisely what they did. And so they should be ashamed of their behaviour, I think, at that time. But, you know, we are where we are. And, you know, we hear people talking about members as dogs, as a rabble, as um, Stalinists, and all the, all the nonsense that you hear, aided and abetted, of course, by the media. After three years of this type of behaviour, it's not surprising that people are saying, man, we've had enough of this. I mean, just, you know, uh, we, members passing votes of no confidence in their sitting MP. That's pretty understandable, I think. It's a pretty reasonable thing to do, in my opinion. It's a democratic thing to do. What they're doing is they're putting their MPs on notice saying, look, we're not satisfied with your conduct. We think you should get behind the leader. You should get behind us and start fighting these Tories. Get the Tories out. That's what you should be doing. Now, to me, I think, you know, passing that, those votes in their comments is the other it, perfectly reasonable, perfectly reasonable, uh, and uh, well within the terms of uh, the Labour Party, well within the terms of uh, you know reasonable and decent uh, debate, and um, the way it's being characterised as, as some sort of you know militant thugs who are you know causing havoc. I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. But back to the leadership anyway. So 5% of the MPs will be the threshold, uh, as I understand it. Uh, and then 10% of constituency Labour parties and 10% of affiliated trade and or 10% affiliated uh, trade unions. You can have a combination of both, but you don't have to have 10% of each. So that seems to be perfectly reasonable. Uh, and I think we won't therefore be in a situation where literally with a minute to go before the deadline, I mean, if you've written that into a screenplay, He'd have said, oh, that was very interesting, but it never happened in real life. And yet it did. It did. So, um, so that was great. And, the, and so that, I think, is really in, important. And uh, I would urge, obviously, anybody to, when you're having your mandate in meetings, to you know, mandate your delegates to obviously support that recommendation to ensure that we can, you know, we can get, whenever Jeremy decides to step down, we can ensure that there is a common sense socialist on the ballot paper. And of course, Jeremy's going to go on for a long time, of course, because he's a vegetarian, boring on a vegan. <laughs> and the vegans are going to inherit the Earth, comrades, as we all know. So, uh, you know, he's going to go on a long time. Uh, but as I say, whenever he does decide to uh, step down, then we've got to make sure, I think, that we, you know, we have a full panoply of opinion on the, on the ballot paper. And I think that recommendation coming through from the Democracy Review recommendations, it's got to go through the NEC, of course, uh, but I'm pretty sure they're going to sign that one off. Uh, and that will be really helpful, I think, in, in making sure that we can continue the trajectory that the party's been going in, which has inspired so many people since Jeremy was elected as our leader. Another area which I think is going to be really important and incredibly significant, and that is how we make policy in the party. The national policy reform is not really fit for purpose. It was set up by Tony Blair, really to try and move any unseemly discussions away from party conference and to turn the party conference into like a set from Good Morning Britain with the, the captures and the softball questions and all that kind of nonsense and there wasn't really very much politics there and then there was a bit kind of cheerleading session when the leader came and, and addressed the, uh, the masses. 
And I think we, well, I think I know Jeremy's keen for, you know, conference to become a kind of much more policy focused uh, occasion, but also to look at the opportunities that this new digital age provides for us to maybe enter into an era where we can embrace digital democracy so we can involve all of our members in the direction of travel and the policy, key policy decisions that we take as a party. Wouldn't we be a much better party if we'd done that, or if we do that? Because, you know, contrary to the way in which some people characterise members, as I was saying just a bit earlier on, you know, if we, like Ed was saying, if we trusted our members, we wouldn't have made as many mistakes. So none of those things that I outlined earlier on, none of that would have happened. Because no, none of our, well, say not very, very few of our members would have supported that. So giving members a greater influence over policy must be a good thing. The members are the eyes and ears and the voices, the messengers, as Jeremy refers to them. So it can't all be down to Jeremy or the, the, the parliamentarians or the trade union leaders or the, you know, the, the leaders of the movement. I've obviously got a role to play, but the key figures in taking our message out to the masses has got to be the members. So I think it's right and proper, therefore, that we're giving members a great uh, influence over policy direction and I'm hoping, therefore, that there will be a recommendation from the uh, Democracy Review which will you know, embrace that digital uh, democratic opportunity uh, and that, will, I think, will make us uh, a much more effective party. I think it will help to carry Jeremy over the threshold of number 10 and then it will help to sustain us when we get there because it will keep, it will keep the party rooted, it will keep the party more in tune with where, you know, the public's out and so on and be able to kind of feed back that's so because you're there you're in the community aren't you day and night in the workplace in the social clubs in the supermarkets you know having those uh, conversations and there's a really important role i think as well for us to play as party members and that is in inspiring more people to vote to actually turn out and I know people used to say to me when I, because I've always been going on about this, and when, when I first got elected, I was saying, you know, we should be trying to inspire people that, that don't vote to, to actually turn out and vote. Look, the Labour Party, I used to say, has got to stand for something. And when you stand for something, you will inspire some people. But then you'll alienate others, obviously. But shouldn't they, that be what politics is about? Giving people a choice. And so, I mean, I used to be told, oh, well, the thing about people that don't vote, Chris, is that they don't vote, so don't waste your time on them. But I think that's a terribly cynical attitude to take. I think we should be reaching out and giving people a reason to vote. And I think when you do give people a reason to vote, they do turn out in numbers. Look at what happened with the young people. The biggest cohort in this election were the youth. And you know, the future belongs to us, comrades, because the young people are absolutely on side with us. And not just in this country, uh, you know, around the world, over in the US, I was looking at some statistics uh, the other week suggesting that uh, well over 30%, uh, I think it is now, of millennials in the United States of America, the land of free enterprise, describe themselves as socialists, you know? And we, had a, we nearly had Bernie Sanders as the, we should have had Bernie Sanders as the Democratic nominee, and he would have indeed been the president now, had the Democrat establishment not done what the Labour Party establishment tried and failed to do to Jeremy, but they succeeded with, with Bernie and keep him, keep him out. So I think there's a great uh, opportunity if that recommendation does come through the Democracy Review to uh, you know, energise members, give them more influence and then you've got a chance then I think to you know, uh, influence those people who, who don't vote. And they're the biggest cohort still in the, in the election, you know. I mean 2015 it was 15.6 million didn't vote and the Tories got in with his 11 odd million. This time slightly closer, the Tories got in I think with 13 million and um, the uh, the, the, the non-voters were still around 14.4 million. So there's a big task for us still to do. We've got to reach out and, and, and convince people that it's worth voting, it's worth participating in politics. Because a lot of people have switched off politics altogether because they just feel it's just not working for them. It's just not serving their interest. And, you know, politicians and political parties are just not interested. I mean, I think we've got an agenda now which, which does or should and hoping would speak to a lot of, you know, excluded communities. But we've got to go out and speak with people and maybe refine the message, but that can only be done by grassroots members like yourself talking to communities on the ground. The party is now engaging uh, community organisers and, and that I think is going to be so important that we get out and we speak to people and inspire people uh, and win them over 
to come out uh, and vote. And I think, you know, majority will vote. Because if you look at where the lowest turnouts are, they tend to be in those, you know, most deprived communities and working class communities. Uh, and, you know, so it's it predominantly going to be our supporters. And turnout, you know, has been falling. Yes, it went up uh, last time and that was good. Um, but, you know, we lost, as we know, five and a half million votes from 97 to 2010, but we lost three million from 97 to 2001. And the turnout dipped below 60% in the 2001 election and then the new Labour spin doctors swung into action saying oh well, that's all about the politics of contentment people are so content they can't be bothered to vote I mean you know it's absurd I know but so I think uh, there's, a, there's a big opportunity for us there and so I'll look out for that one too and then the two other areas from the democracy review that I wanted to just, uh, briefly touch on is in relation to the uh, regional structures and local government in terms of the regional structures I, I think they need to be significantly democratised I think we're likely to see a one member one vote proposition being put forward to elect regional committees or regional boards as they call them. I think we should move away from the kind of business terminology. We should have regional secretaries and committees, not directors and boards, but we, are, we know what I'm on about in that sense. So I think that will be, that will be a, a big and important step too if we can you know, democratise that one member one vote to scenario to elect those um, uh, committees. Uh, and then I was at one of these meetings where Ian Lavery, the chair of the party, was speaking up in Blythe Valley alongside me. And uh, the Democracy Review obviously was reporting to him as the chair of the party. And uh, one of the ideas that's come through the Democracy Review, whether it survives the NEC deliberations remains to be seen. I hope it does. And if it does, I would urge you to support it. And that is to elect the regional directors. So you'd have then a, you know, much more of a kind of connection with with party members, because I think the regional structures, just the way they're geared up, you know, they're not really fit for purpose. They're too embroiled in naval contemplation, really, you know, and the sort of uh, nonsensical bureaucracy uh, that we, we get involved in sometimes in the party. And I think there should be much more outwardly focused, much more of an emphasis around community organising, supporting constituency Labour parties, supporting the, you know, political education officers, for example, in CLPs, so that we can make our constituency party meetings much more engaging and interesting. I don't know what it's like down in Portsmouth, it might be better than many other parts of the country, but in many parts of the country, you know, we have the boring matters arising, minutes of the last meeting, treasurer's report, councillors, how many potholes have we filled in, how many street lights have we managed to repair, and all that kind of dull stuff. And um, I just think we could make them a lot more engaging and, and, and embark upon, you know, much more sort of political education and have I mean, a lot of people join the party because you know, they want to change the world and they want to engage in political discussion. And I think having those political discussions with ourselves gives us then the, you know, the skills and the confidence then to be sort of taking that message out beyond our own meetings to speak to the wider general public. So we could be having conversations about things like modern monetary theory, for example, or should we be introducing universal basic income and a uh, you know, range of different things that would be, I think, really stimulating and interesting, getting speakers in to talk about these things, people who know a lot more about those sorts of things than I do, to upskill everybody and have those kind of deliberations and conversations and, and, and work out how they might apply at a local level in your particular neck of the woods. I think that'd be brilliant to do that kind of thing. And, uh, and also to be, you know, focusing on the, I don't know, the social side as well. We need to be bringing people in and it's not all necessarily about the heavy duty hard lines in terms of, you know, hard miles in terms of, you know, going out knocking on doors, so that's important of course, but we need to be looking at different ways of campaigning, as I've said, having that sort of political education sessions and so on, making meetings more engaging, uh, but also looking at, you know, and you might be doing some of this already and you don't necessarily need a reason to kind of stimulate that, but I think, you know, promoting the social side, building relationships, building friendships, building solidarity really. You kind of get to know each other and become friends, you know what I mean, it's more likely then you're going to go out and you're going to feel more motivated to go out and support each other and that's what it's all about it seems to me you know building solidarity amongst ourselves so that we can go out and build solidarity in the communities that we want to serve because there's you know there's massive challenges facing the country the sixth or fifth depending on which kind of uh, methodology you're looking at but it's a hugely massive economy in the world fifth or sixth biggest economy in the world and yet in every town and city in the country we've got people sleeping in shop doorways you know we've got people in precarious employment and all the other major problems that there are and uh, you know we just need to find a way I think of of inspiring people and making people feel confident that Labour will deliver that their Labour's their party that we're doing politics with people not to people 
be far too long. It's like the Labour Party's going to be doing things to people in that sense, you know? And we want to be doing stuff with people. And we can only do that, I think, once we really embrace community organising and bringing people on board. And I think, um, to come back to the Democracy Review recommendation, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the ideas around, you know, democratising the regional structures and how we make policy, etc., will help to facilitate that. The, the final thing I want to talk about, just in relation to the democracy review, is in terms of local government. And the, uh, I think the LCF, the Local Campaign Forum, is completely unfit for purpose, really. You know? uh, and I think there's a, um, a likelihood to see the democracy review make a recommendation, which the NEC, I'm hoping, will sign off, to dispense with the LCFs and, and, and have some form of like a district party to be reintroduced which will make Labour groups much more accountable to the members, which should be the way we go, which is absolutely right, in my opinion. You know, I think you know, people talk about the Westminster bubble, but I think there's a bit of a town hall bubble very often where the Labour group is a bit of a disconnect. And I used to be a Labour group leader, so I'm not sort of speaking out of turn in that sense. But there can be a, a disconnect, I think, between the Labour group and the party in the borough or the district or whatever. You know, and, and, and I think we've... And again, that Ed Miliband maxim... If you listen to the members, you won't make as many mistakes. And Labour groups are as prone to... Look, we're all human, aren't we? And I'm sure it's with the best of intention, but we're all prone to making mistakes. And I think sometimes you have that disconnect, that bit of elitism sort of thing, well, you kind of don't know what you're on about. Look, we've got all the information over here. I I just don't think that works. I just don't think it's fit for purpose. It's not a model that actually has delivered in that sense, particularly over the last eight years, where we've... Our offer, really, in local government has been, look, vote for us because we'll manage the Tory cuts better than the Tories will. That's not good enough. And I'm not suggesting that we should be setting up or, or urging Labour groups to set illegal budgets because there's no future in that either. They'd just put <laughs> commissioners in and, you know, you'd be, could be in the worst place. But there are alternatives, well, an alternative, and that's the progressive council tax idea, which has been made possible by that great socialist, Eric Pickles who piloted the uh, Local Government Finance Act, 2012 Local Government Finance Act, through the House of Commons, which allows local authorities to give differential discounts. So essentially what you can do, using the Eric Pickles model, his legislation, you could use that to introduce a budget for the many, a redistributive local budget. Now... It's a stopgap measure. I'll be, I was punting this around. It's one of the reasons I stepped down from the front bench, because it's slightly beyond my portfolio area. And, you know, it wasn't Labour Party policy, but my position was, it not have to be Labour Party policy. It's the law of the land. Eric Pickles has made this possible. And I just felt that Labour in local government is on its knees, really. And this is an opportunity, in my opinion, for Labour in local government to say, we're going to stop the Tory cuts. And we're actually going to do it in a way that puts the burden on those with the broadest shoulders. And we're going to protect the overwhelming majority of residents living in the borough. And we did a model for Derby Labour Group, which they didn't take up, uh, and I wish they had, obviously, because I think had we done so, I don't think we'd have ended up losing the council. We ended up losing the council, the leader lost his seat to a UKIPper, believe it or not. Uh, the only... The only council in the country where UKIP actually gained a seat. There's a lot of racism going on. I mean, you know, Ranjit's a good guy, uh, but he did lose his way a bit, and UKIP, you know, seized on that, but then they also seized on the racism angle, and they used all, every dirty trick in the book. Nevertheless, you know, we, 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 we lost the seat for a range of different reasons. Um, but I think if we'd have embraced this uh, progressive council tax idea, that might have given us a chance to win that election because um, it would have enabled the local authority, because the local authority has been getting the blame. It's been very deliberate. The Tories have devolved blame for cuts. Biggest cuts are in local government, aren't they? And the biggest cuts in local government are in labour areas. And uh, the local authority was getting the blame for it. And this has happened all over the place, you know. And sometimes labour groups haven't really handled the cuts, I don't think, very well. They sort of almost, they have kind of owned them. Yeah, well, you know, and almost as if it is them that's doing it, you know, rather than continually making the case that these cuts are made in Westminster. Well, there's only so many times people are kind of willing to sort of, I suppose, take that, that on board. Anyway, the, the progressive council tax idea is something which I think, uh, you know, could uh, you know, stop the cuts and give you a chance to start growing the uh, public services in your local authority area. It won't necessarily work in every area because it will just depend on how many properties you've got in the, in the, in the, in the higher bands, as it were. 
some areas it worked very well. I was talking to the Labour group in Harringay, for example, and uh, they got thousands of properties in Band H. So they could freeze council tax right up to Band E and just lump a load of um, uh, a big increase on, on the people, you know, the broad shoulders, as it were. And anybody who's in a big house who's asset rich, if you like, but cash poor, could be protected through an enhanced council tax support scheme, which you'd have the resources for through raising the extra revenue through the progressive council tax idea. You'd then have to go to a referendum, though, because Eric Pickles also brought forward a piece of legislation the year before, the Localism Act in 2011, which stipulated that if you wanted to, and it's more or less a reiteration of where we previously were anyway, if you wanted to increase your council tax above the level stipulated by the Secretary of State, you'd have to go to a referendum. And obviously you would be putting it, because you'd be like doubling it, potentially, or even tripling it, maybe, for people in Band H dwellings to actually raise the finance that you need. But the campaign then that you would be engaged in is to say to people, right, there's the choice. We can either this year, it was... We'll increase your council tax by 6% and continue cutting your services, or we'll freeze, and depending on how many bigger properties you've got, we might even be able to reduce, but at least freeze the council tax for 85 to 90% of the households, and we're going to ask those with the broadest shoulders to pay a bit more to protect your services. So there'll be no cuts, freeze your council tax, and no cuts and some growth. Well, couldn't you win that? Could you win that? I mean, you know, you'd be pretty poor campaigners if you couldn't win an argument like that, it seems to me. But no group in the country is taking it up. The OGA Labour Group sent a, a, a memo round to every Labour Group leader in the country with a big spreadsheet saying how the Williamson model won't work. There is no such thing as a Williamson model. It's just an idea that we put forward uh, for Derby, and we, we suggested this might be one way to do it, where you, you doubled it for the, for the bandage properties, and then you, through this differential discount that you can uh, bring about now, thanks to Sir Eric Pickles, nice man, not... Um, you can then, you know, 100% increase, we suggested for Band H, and then you'd like have a 20% discount on the increase for Band G properties, a 40% for Band F properties, a 60% for Band E, and an 80% because we had to incorporate Band D properties, regrettably, because 85% of the households in Derby are in Band A to C. But so, well, the point I'm making is there's a million and one different permutations, and it won't necessarily work in every local authority area, but it was just an idea for local government to say, look, we're going to look at doing something a bit different until such times we can get a Labour government. Because all these great things we're going to do when we get into government, including for local government, the municipalisation agenda of the energy, etc., and things like that, because we're going to have a very different model of uh, public ownership. It won't be the kind of top-down statist approach, it's very much a bottom-up approach. So municipalisation, cooperatives and things like that as a, method, as a, as a model of, of ownership. Uh, so... Uh, things like that and maybe a land value tax different ways of, of raising finance for local government because there needs to be a root and branch reform that absolutely does it seems to me of funding for local government but that's all jam tomorrow I mean you know you go to the local council elections and say well we're going to do all this when we get into government but meanwhile vote for us because we'll manage the Tory cuts better than the Tories will that's, that's basically all we're able to offer it seems to me so I think that, that is uh, you know, something that we could be doing now why have I gone on about that well, because another proposition that is being mooted is much of the chagrin of, of a number of Labour Group leaders, it has to be said, is that instead of the council is electing the Labour Group leader, that all of the members in the borough will elect the Labour Group leader. And I think that would then give you a much better fighting chance of having a real genuine dialogue about some progressive ideas, solutions, such as the progressive council. And there may be other things, you know, I mean, like the Preston model, some of the stuff that they've done is, is, is really good, actually, uh, in terms of how they've used, you know, local government procurement, etc., to support local, the local economy and local businesses and, and, you know, decent jobs and whatever else, you know. Um, but those, that dialogue is, is difficult at the minute, uh, and there's no, <laughs> there's no real accountability in that sense. I mean, you, know, you can select your council, whatever else, but I just think that if you, if you were electing the members of the borough, were electing the Labour group leader, you'd have a much better chance then, I think, of influencing the agenda going forward, in my opinion. You know. So that's another one which I'm hoping will survive the uh, discussion at the NEC. I know, as I say, a lot of um, Labour group leaders have rallied against that and, uh, and the LGA Labour group and are not in favour of it. Uh, as I understand it, uh, and so there'll be some pressure to say they should drop that. But as Ian Labour has said, anything that isn't in the recommendations for
from this iteration of the democracy review doesn't mean that will never ever happen. So, you know, if we don't get everything that we want through the democracy review this time, let me say we stop, we keep demanding more democracy. We absolutely have to do that, it seems to me. Although I think I'm hoping that, you know, we will get quite a few decent things out of it. Anyway, so I've probably gone on for far too long. I have a little cluster, I must have been gone for nearly an hour. How do I go keep talking so much? There's only one person fell asleep so far as well, so it's not too bad. Um, but, uh, no, the, uh, the final thing that I just want to talk about is mandatory selection. It's one which has got a lot of uh, hackles up. And I think that's really crucial that we have mandatory reselection because that will make members uh, uh, of Parliament much more accountable, I think, to their members, much more in tune with their members, and I think it will make them better representatives as well. You know, when we had mandatory reselection in the past, in uh, the early 1980s, there were very few people deselected. You know, some people have tried to characterise this democracy uh, roadshow as a as a deselection tour, and that's just rubbish. I mean, there's, there's a number of Labour MPs who I would love to see deselected, don't get me wrong. And I think they know that I feel like that. They'd like to see me deselected, I can tell you that too. And believe it or not, I used to be popular when I was first elected in, in 2010 with the PLP, but, but not anymore, sadly. Um, but it wouldn't be my decision, nor should it be my decision. It would be down to the members at each local constituency. And I think that any member of parliament worth their salt, who's, who's, who's doing a decent job in representing their constituency, having a, you know, a, a good relationship with their members, and, you know, an, an honest and full and frank conversation. You don't necessarily always have to agree. I know some of them say, well, we're not a delegate, you know, and bloody delegate to the, to the, uh, to the GCs, you know, to members. And, uh, well, we're not really asking them to be delegates, but we're just asking them to be Labour representatives, to actually honour Labour's values, to honour and respect Labour's policies to respect Labour members because without Labour members none of them would be there and for those who say and indeed I was on Channel 4 last night and they were saying about Chuck Ramuno and he switched you like we're all dogs um, and they said well what about because I was saying look you know Chuck is a bright bloke but he's increasingly irrelevant and they would say oh do you mean do you are the 32,000 people that voted for him irrelevant then so I said no of course not but they only voted <laughs> Labour or voted for Chucker because he was standing as a Labour candidate. They voted for the Labour Party and the Labour policy agenda. Actually, they voted, got a bigger margin, ironically, because of Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, you know, although a lot of people are thinking, you know, and they say this, it's because of the force of their own, you know, personality and their, their great acumen as, as campaigners in their local constituency. And yes, there will be some MPs, most MPs will have a bit of a personal following, but, it, it, you know, it's not enough to see the sort of level of increase in support that they got this time. It's because we had a common sense socialist programme which inspired people and because we had a leader who people genuinely believed in. And, uh, you know, lots of people really, really do support, as I've already said, 70 to 80%. Did you see the Giles Brandeth going around looking for secret socialists in, in, in uh, Gillingham, the capital of the home counties? And he had, a, he had a clipboard like this and he went and stopping people and he was asking them if they supported things like that. They were, all, they were all agreeing with it. And then he said, well, you're a secret socialist, so what do you mean? And he said, well, these are the policies of Jeremy Corbyn. He turned it around as a big policy of a big picture of Jeremy. And they stepped back, you know, in, in horror at that. But that gives you an indication, a flavour, that there is real uh, support there for it. So these MPs who think that, oh, it's all about them and what they do as individual, yeah, that will have a role. But, you know, we are collective. And it's about, you know, what we do together as a party and the policies that we are standing on. And for anybody who thinks that their mandate is exclusively and only from the electorate, well, that is true, the mandate does come from them, but my, my response to that is, well, go stand as an independent pal and see how far you get, because they wouldn't get elected. That's the truth of it, you know? And if they believe that, they should go and they should stand as independents if, they can't, if they're not prepared to accept, um, the, you know, the members having a greater involvement. Now, that's not part of the terms of reference of the Democracy Review. The Democracy Review is focused on these other areas, and there's a few other areas as well, how, you know, BAME labour and all that kind of stuff. I have got time to go into all those uh, details. Uh, but there, is, there are, I think, four or five motions down from different constituency Labour parties, one of whom is uh, Labour International. I think their motion is probably the most... Uh, comprehensive and probably the one that we ought to get behind. That's the one I'm urging people to get behind. And what that would do is stipulate that selections would, open selections would have to take place in the fourth year of a parliament. So after 36 months, 
selection process would have to be started and it would have to be concluded within 48 months. So in that fourth year, that's when you go through the selection process. And then, you know, people can apply to go on the shortlist and then the city MP, but they're going to be in a strong position because they're the city incumbent in that sense. And, you know, a decision will be made. The other element of the democracy, of the uh, Labour International's resolution, motion, is to say that for where, where we haven't won the seat, where there's an opposition party, that the selection process would start after 12 months, so we'd get our candidates in early. Now, that seems to be a perfectly reasonable proposition, it seems to me. I think it would be an incredibly powerful statement for all MPs to, those that aren't deselected, obviously, or some potentially will be, but to have that endorsement of their members, that's a real feeling, you know, it's like a morale booster, I think, isn't it, you know, and, and what it would do, of course, is bring us into line with every other democracy, as far as I'm aware, in the, in the world, you know, it's not that extraordinary for sitting members of the legislature to go through like a primary process, so why should we be any different in this country? I mean, if you look at any uh, elected position in, in Britain, in, in community organisations, in, you know, in trade unions, local authorities, and the rest of it, people go through a periodic endorsement process, don't they? I mean, it's just an annual thing in certain circumstances. Even the secretary, you know, of Jeremy's Allotment Association is subject to mandatory selection every 12 months. You have the allotment holders marching on the AGM with their hose and spades and forks held aloft demanding a change. We want a change. We want to elect a new secretary. Well, they don't really do that, but if they did, you know, it wouldn't be a democratic outrage. You, the, the secretary wouldn't be standing with his hands on his hips saying, I've been the secretary since 19 canteen. How dare you have the temerity to suggest that we should have another secretary? That just wouldn't happen. It's just normal, common parlance. It's just the way organisations of any democratic organisation operate. So I hope that people will get behind mandatory reselection, <laughs> that they'll get behind all of the democracy review recommendations so that we can transform not just our party, but we can transform our country for the long term, change the balance of power forever. That's the prize why like that old uh, protest song from the uh, Deep South when the civil rights campaigners in the 50s and the 60s were campaigning for civil rights. That song is keep your eyes on the prize. And so despite all of the opprobrium and the attacks and the smears that we get, we have to stay together. That's our strength in solidarity. Don't be demoralised. Don't give up. Keep going. Just think we're standing on the shoulders of giants. The trials and tribulations that people that came before us went through, what the toll puddle martyrs went through, what the early trade union uh, members went, all the trade union members went through, and the early parliamentarians and Labour Party members. And look what we achieved, you know, 40 odd years, just 40, relatively short period of time when you get to my time of life, it doesn't feel that long. After Labour elected its first MPs, we'd, we'd founded the National Health Service, the welfare state. And full employment, you know, and increasing, improving living standards year on year. That's what we achieved. Labour achieved that. And we can do it again. The prize is a huge one. And we have to keep our eyes on that prize because, as I say, it's about not just winning an election. It's about changing the course of history. And what I say in these meetings, you're not only grassroots members, comrades, you are history makers. Let's go out and make history. Thank you for listening. Thank you,